Hey, Snyder Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Thanks so much for being here. I was out of town this weekend. Anything, uh... Anything noteworthy happened? Classic 2020. Here we are. Where do we start? Um, let me make this point first, and then we'll get into the, we'll break down the details. F let's try all the different scenarios. First of all, let's flip around. If there was a Democratic president right now, if Hillary Clinton were president and there were a Democratic Senate, do you think <laughs> they would say, you know what? Let's wait till the next election. That'll be more fair. No way! They'd vote for someone right now, they would be done today. Let's do, uh, well, we know what would happen, and we'll get to this in a second, but we know what would happen if there was a, a, a Democratic president with a Republican Senate. So let's flip that around. If there was a Republican president, so Trump was president with a Democratic Senate, do you think the Senate would say, the Democratic Senate would say, you know what, President Trump, you are the president. Whoever you think is best for the job, we'll go ahead and sign off on that. No chance! So the only fourth scenario is what we have right now, Republican president, Republican Senate. Of course you nominate someone, of course you confirm them. You have plenty of time. And reminder, and we'll get to this in a little bit, your term doesn't end November 3rd. Your term is not over on November 3rd. You're the president and you are in the Senate until January 21st. Many more months to go. Okay, it's 40 something days till the election, but you got another two months after that. Plenty of time. Okay. So that's the bottom line. And everyone knows that too. Stop pretending that that's not the case. Of course that's the case. All right. Let's go back to the very beginning. Uh, in case, honestly, in case you did miss this over the weekend or you check out over the weekend, um, I just want to make sure we're all, we all have this background and, uh, before we proceed. So uh, this is Donald Trump getting off the plane. Uh, I, I forget what night it was. I guess it would have been Saturday night, I guess. I don't know. Um, what a weird, surreal moment this was. Tiny Dancer was playing in the background, and I thought when I first saw this clip, I thought someone added it to the clip, and I was like, why would someone add Tiny Dancer to the end of this clip? But then I saw another clip, and it was still playing, and apparently it was just playing in the background, like on speakers. So here's the clip. Just died. Wow. I didn't know that. I just, uh, you're telling me now for the first time. She led an amazing life. What else can you say? She was an amazing woman. Whether you agreed or not, she was an amazing woman who led an amazing life. I'm actually sad to hear that. I am sad to hear that. Thank you very much. So, First of all, like, that's perfect. Couldn't, couldn't you have seen him say something kind of snarky, right? Oh, oh, our, oh, is that right? Ginsburg died, oh, that's, that's terrible. Right before the election, too, well. Uh, <laughs> hope she rests in peace, or whatever, right? And then he kind of like smiles and walks off, like, whatever. But he didn't do it, like, that, not at all. What he just did there was perfect. Too perfect. So the reporter who asked him that question is Tamara Keith from NPR. This is what she said. Uh, she said, being a White House correspondent is surreal. Last night, shouting over Air Force One's engines and tiny dancer, I asked the president to react to the death of Justice Ginsburg, and he responded as if this was the first he was hearing of it. As if. As if it was the first he was hearing of it. So this is a great example here of we can all watch the same thing and just make up whatever you want. We, just all, we all saw that video. And if you like Trump, then you saw a real genuine reaction from a misunderstood and good man. Mi or mischaracterized, like unfairly mi characterized as a bad person. But actually here he is genuinely in a real moment there being a good person. If you don't like Trump, then that was a contrived setup. Right, that was acting, a performance from a con man. Here he is acting as if he heard it for the first time. So, it's whatever you want it to be. Can't convince you otherwise. Uh, but I will add that it, it is also surreal to be a consumer of news 
with reporters acting as if they're objective. This is the Washington Post. Uh, let's do the Scalia one first. This is the day after Justice Scalia died. Supreme Court conservative dismayed liberals. <laughs> All right. And then this is the Washington Post after uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. A pioneer to vote into equality. <laughs> those, those seem different. Those seem like they have different levels of praise. Uh, also, don't think that the left loved RBG because she was a woman. That's not it. All this women supporting women talk, that's out the window. Because Trump, and we'll talk about this with a guest coming up, we'll talk about the Trump's short list of nominees, which we'll probably hear the answer of in just a couple days here. Uh, Trump, I predict, is probably going to nominate Amy Coney Barrett, and a woman, and you're going to, well, Trump said he's going to nominate a woman. Right? So uh, the, all the, like, oh, the breaking glass ceilings or whatever, like, all that talk's out the window. Barrett has seven kids. So you're going to hear the feminist left attack her for having seven kids because the left is not pro-woman. They're for, all for power and they'll use women to get there. But in the process, they're also anti-mom. Like, that's the true feminist underpinnings is anti-mom. And Barrett would say that she's a mom before anything else and the left can't have that. She has seven kids. One's adopted from Haiti. They adopted him when he was three. And then another, they, they one of their other kids has uh, special needs. The woman's a saint but she's gonna be attacked as a devil, just like Kavanaugh was. This was uh, Feinstein a couple years ago on Barrett's confirmation to a lower court, and it's about her being a Catholic. When you read your speeches, um, the conclusion one draws is that the dogma lives loudly within you. And that's of concern when you come to big issues that large numbers of people have fought for for years in this country. Amazing, the dogma lives loudly within you, which if you're a Christian, I guess it's a great compliment, especially coming from Dianne Feinstein. And of course she's talking about abortion, right? So uh, we'll talk about that a little later as well, because that's the root of what all this is about. Okay, let's talk uh, politics this, just to, again, make sure we're on the same page. There is no reason why a Republican president should not nominate and why a Republican Senate, a Senate should not confirm a Supreme Court justice tomorrow. There's, there's no reason whatsoever. People have been saying, and will continue to say, so it's important to be reminded of this, uh, they'll, they'll continue to bring up Merrick Garland, who sometimes I call Garland Merrick. I can't, I, guess, I can't tell which is, I think it's Merrick Garland. So the background of that, Scalia died in 2016. Uh, it was about 200 and something, maybe like 250 days or something until before the next election, 2016. Uh, and Obama nominated Merrick Garland. The difference was it was a Republican controlled Senate. Right? So the Republicans said, no, we're not going to confirm a nominee of yours until after the election. So Barack Obama was president, Democrat, it was the end of his term, end of his term. Republican Senate said, no, we're not going to confirm. So today, we're 40 days until the end of Trump's first term. And Democrats are saying, well, wait a second. I thought we should nominate or confirm anyone this close to an election like you guys did in 2016. Now, the, the obvious difference is the Republicans have the Senate. The Republicans have the White House and the Senate. End of story. Period, end of story. And you know that if the Democrats had both, they would do it. Like, I was telling my wife about this. So my wife is an awesome soundboard for stuff like this because she is not political at all. She doesn't care about politics at all. And doesn't follow politics. So, like, if something, if she hears about a political thing, it means that thing broke through the bubble. And it's a no, therefore a noteworthy thing. So, obviously, this did, right? So she was asking all about it, and I said, uh, well, in 2016, when Scalia died, um, you know, it was you know, 200 days before the election or whatever, and the Republicans said they're not going to confirm. And she goes, well, did Obama nominate someone? I said, yeah, of course. And she goes, well, then why should Trump not nominate someone? I go, like, oh, yeah, ob like, obviously. Actually, 29 times a vacancy has come up on the Supreme Court in an election year. 29 times. And the president nominated someone all 29 times. 
So Trump would be the first, if Trump did not nominate someone, it'd be the first time that's ever happened. So of course you nominate someone, and this time the Republicans have the Senate, just do it. And it doesn't take long to confirm someone. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg confirmation process was 42 days. Sandra Day O'Connor was like um, like 32 days or something in the 30s. And then uh, John Paul Stevens was 19 days. It took 19 days to nominate. Trump has 40 something, like 42 or 43 or something. There's plenty of time to do this. And that's before the election. You can still do it after the election. There's nothing in the Constitution that says you can't even do it after the, the election process. There's plenty of time to get this done. So again, they say it's hypocrisy for Trump to jam someone through in the last 40 days. I don't know. In, uh, so back in 2016, the Republicans, who again said they're not going to see, to hear Obama's nomination, they invoked what they called the Biden rule. Now I hate all these stupid rules. Everyone talks about the McConnell rule, the Biden rule, blah, blah. There's no rule. It's the Constitution. What's the Constitution say? What's the constitutional process? What's your constitutional responsibility as leaders. But the Biden rule back in 1992, Biden was the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and he was musing about if President H.W. Bush, uh, if, if he were to nominate someone to the Supreme Court in his last year. Now, he never had the opportunity to, but Biden was just talking out loud about it. And he said, as the head of the Senate committee, again, split White House, Republican White House, Democratic Senate, that the Senate should not here, the nominee, until the end of the political season. That was the quote, the end of the political season, whatever that even means. And that's my point. That's my big point I want to make here. If 40 days is too close to the end of a president's first term, and again, it's not even the end of the first term, that's just until November 3rd. There's just still have a couple months after that, until January 21st. But let's just do the 40 days. If 40 days is too close, right, to nominate a justice, what is the sufficient amount of time before an election when you should be allowed to nominate someone, right? So when, when, I mean, especially these days, when are we not in a political season? Biden in 92 says, oh, we shouldn't do it in a political season. It's always a political season. Four years is not a long time to be president if you really think about it. So if, let's say Trump wins re-election on November 4th, and the next day he nominates someone. The Dems could legitimately say, oh, too close to an election. It's only four years away. He's a lame duck president anyway. You should, right? You can always use the excuse of it's too close to the election. So what's that line? Like if you were, if Trump was 80 days away from the election, would that be okay? If Trump was a year away, 400 days away, like what's that line where the Democrats would be like, no, okay, fine. You can always use that excuse of it's too close to the election. So again, bottom line, I'll say it for the thousandth time, flip the rolls, and this isn't even like a shady point. I mean, like if the Democrats were in power, if the Democrats are the Senate and the, and the, the uh, White House, do you think they would nominate someone or would they wait until that? Of course they would. This is uh, Trump talking to Hugh Hewitt uh, back in August. And just go to the end of the exchange here. Uh, but Hugh Hewitt's asking him about this exact thing. Uh, he says, no, I would move quickly. Why not? I mean, they would. <laughs> the Democrats would if they were in this position. And everyone knows that's true. It's not even, um, like I say, it's not even like, uh, it's not hypocrisy. And I've heard people say, oh, it's gamesmanship. I've heard people say, oh, it's, this is politics. And like, that's closer. But it's not even that. It's, it's the process. It's not hypocrisy. It's not even, gamesmanship even sounds like a little shady. It's just the process. <laughs> this is, this is like when, when, when we're still in the president's term. So when is it no longer like the will of the people to have the president be the president and the Republicans control the Senate? It's a four-year term. We're still in it. As Ruth Bader Ginsburg said back in 2016 about the Senate confirming Garland, she said, she said, that's their job. She said there's nothing in the Constitution that says the president stops being the president in his last year. Fill the seat. True story, Mike Slater. Spread the word.
Hey, Senator Crusaders, coming up in the next segment, we're going to talk to someone about the uh, president's shortlist for nominees, and we'll get a little head start on that. I just want to play, this is RBG. This is the same moment when she said, you don't stop being the president in your last year of office. Here's what she said after that. I, I do think that cooler heads will prevail, I hope sooner rather than later. The president is elected for four years, not three years, so the power that he has in year three continues into year four, and maybe some members of the Senate will, will wake up and appreciate that that's how it should be. Okay. And friendly reminder, year four goes into January 21st. Um, there's also the side argument that we need to pick a Supreme Court justice now because the election could very well come to a 269-269 tie, <laughs> right? which is like bananas, and uh, or some other shenanigans somehow, uh, like Bush v. Gore, like how do we even count the votes in a particular state, whatever. And then it would go to an eight-person court, and then that could end in 4-4. It's like, oh, well, then what do you do? And that would be like the most 2020 thing that could possibly happen, which means it's very likely that that could happen. And it was RBG in 2016 said eight is not a good number. Shouldn't have eight justices, not a good thing. Uh, real quick, uh, on, on her legacy. So after someone dies, there's always this period where they're the greatest person to have ever lived and they're an icon and all this. But RBG's had a couple years here of, of documentaries and movies and the notorious RBG and this iconography about her and just they love, love of RBG. Um, maybe today, uh, it could be as early as to maybe tomorrow, <laughs> when the left feels it's safe to come out and talk about what a terrible person she was because uh, she should have, they're gonna say this, she should have retired under Obama four years ago when she was 83. <laughs> okay, she could, have just, she could have retired seven years ago when she was 80 and then had Obama nominate someone, but she decided to stay on and then through Obama's term and then st stayed on during, a, or well, she risked it going to the election, right? So she risked having a Republican or Trump in the White House. And, and the, I think the left was like trying to keep her alive for all these years and she just couldn't make it. So all this celebrating RBG, uh, that's, that's over, right? You'll start hearing much more from the left about how selfish she was for staying on the court these last few years and not gaming it better um, and leaving when Obama was in the White House. Anyway, um, you've heard of this dying wish. Have you heard of her dying, her last dying wish? First of all, I don't believe it for a second. <laughs> it came out right away, and the source was her granddaughter. Okay, and here's the exact line. Like, this is so ridiculous. My most fervent wish, this is from her granddaughter, my most fervent wish is that I will not be replaced until a new president is installed. <laughs> no way did she say that, <laughs> right? Clearly that line was interpreted through another person. Like who on their deathbed says, oh, it is my most fervent wish. Like no, no, no one's ever said that. And then also that weird word, until a new president is installed. Like what is that? That is a PR written sentence. But either way, beyond the fact that that never happened, even if it did, it's not your seat. It's not RBG's seat. The founders did not create a Ruth Bader Ginsburg seat that she forevermore will be in charge of even after her death. She sat in a seat that many other justices have sat in. It's, she's, she's, for this, most recently, she was justice number six. So it goes like from left to right. So the, 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 the justice in the middle, the chief justice, and then to our right is the most senior, and then right, and then it goes back and bounces back and forth. So she was in seat number six, but like, whatever. Like, that's not yours. I, I, and I doubt she ever said that, honestly, because that seems like a thing beneath her to have even suggested, that this is my seat, it's not your seat. And something I'm certain of, if it were Justice Clarence Thomas who passed away this weekend, no Democrat would care in the slightest what his dying wish was. My most, my most fervent wish. Uh, also worth noting, Hans Feeney, who we love, have him on the show a lot. Um, he said, uh, however the rabid left responds to an RGB replacement, RBG, is how they would have responded had she died three years ago. Right, so, so they're gonna add all this like drama. Like, oh, it's just 40 days left. If she died three years ago, they'd have the same freak out. Just, it'd be the exact same thing. So don't get distracted by 
that. This is just what they do. Uh, n uh, this guy, I don't know how to pronounce his Twitter name, but he's big on Twitter. You maybe know it's a neon taster. I don't know what it. He says politics are like sports. Every team will take advantage. Will take every advantage they get, even if they act all upset when their opponents do the same thing. It's so normal that calling it hypocrisy feels incorrect. It's just gamesmanship at this point. That's what I was talking about before. I don't even know if it's gamesmanship. It's just, it's just the process. Here's Trump. Uh, he says, we were put in this position of power and importance to make decisions for the people who so proudly elected us, the most important of which has been considered to be the selection of Supreme Court justices. We have this obligation without delay. Would you expect him to play it any other way? Last point before we get to our guests. Um, so Susie Collins and Lisa Murkowski, uh, Maine and Alaska, have both said that they're not going to vote for the nominee for now, uh, which means Republicans have 53 senators. So uh, they can have three defectors. So there's two. So they can have one more person, one more Republican defect, and then it would be a 50-50 tie, and then you'd have Joe Biden break the tie. Okay, we have the drama. I can't fathom an argument of why you're a Republican and you would not take this opportunity right now. Why would you not take this opportunity? What, like, what do you think? What do you think you're going to get out of this? What do you think the left, the Democrats, are going to do for you now or for the country? Right? You think they're going to embrace you? You think the Democrats are going to be so grateful for your magnanimity that if if Biden wins the presidency, he would he would not nominate and approve the furthest left nominee conceivable? Right? And Biden wins, and they're like, oh, well, Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins were so kind to us in the last uh, you know, a couple months ago that let's not nominate this absolute nut job to the Supreme Court. You think they're going to repay your gesture of kindness one day? Give me a break. It's not happening. Do you think, like, what, like what, what could possibly be your argument? I don't even see the moral principle at play, right? I don't, I don't, I don't get that. There's no. I'm not, no one's breaking the rules, right? If there was, if the Republicans or if Trump, like, came up with some new rule where, I don't even know, like, you only need, what was, by it was Harry Reid who changed it from 60 to 51. But, like, you only needed, like, f 40 people to vote for or something. Or, like, I don't even, like, then I could see, like, a matter of principle being like, whoa, 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 we don't need to change the process. We don't want to change the process for voting, for nominating or, or uh, approving somebody. I'm against the process because that sets a bad precedent in the future. I don't know, like, what, that, that, that's not happening. It's the, it's the process. Everything's the same as it always has been, at least since 2013, with the nuclear option of 51. So, not the, what, I, what's, your, what's your point? Your party's in charge of the White House and the Senate. Use it just like the other side would. I'm trying to think of a sports analogy. I don't, I don't even know what a sports analogy would be. If you know one, like, tweet me, sir. Send me a note of what you think the best sports analogy here is. And I can't really think of one because there's no rule that was broken. No one's breaking a rule here, so you can't add that into your analogy. So the best I can think of, let's say you're, you're in a football game and one team is going to kick a field goal to win the game and it's a bad snap, so they, they miss the field goal. So then you get the ball and now you can win it with a field goal, but you feel bad or something? <laughs> so you whiff it on purpose? Or like you... You fumble on purpose and like hand the ball to the other side. I don't even because it's the right thing to do or something. Like I don't even know. I don't even get what you're doing there. Like let's say you're it's like the Olympics and they're like running the mile and you're winning the whole time. But you think, you know, this guy behind me, he's trained really hard this year. And uh, he's been through a lot lately. Maybe he should win. You just like let him pass. <laughs> I, even, I, like, I can't think of an analogy because it's so illogical. As Darren Beatty said, he said, moments like this are the reason political parties exist. They allow one more defector. Republicans have one more. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Senator Crusaders, let's bring in an expert here. Kelly Shackelford is the CEO, President, Chief Legal Counsel of the First Liberty Institute. Mr. Shackelford, how are you, sir? Great. How are you? Good. Very good. I'm glad you're here. So can we take a minute to talk about uh, shortlist? The president just, was it like last week, he put out another shortlist. Um, 
so let's talk about some of these people on here real quick. It seems like the uh, f- the person that he's most likely going to nominate is uh, Amy Barrett, Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, what do we know about her? Uh, she's she went through a pretty uh, uh, interesting, I would say, r- rough uh, confirmation hearing last time. She was attacked. Uh, if you'll remember, uh, that was where uh, uh, Senator Feinstein said. Uh, I'm concerned because, quote, your dogma lives loudly within you. In other words, she actually believes her faith. Um, so Amy Coney Barrett, and there was a, fortunately, there was a great reaction against that after it happened. But I, I think that tells you a little bit of who she is, strong, Catholic. Um, she was a law professor at Notre Dame, uh, very bright, had written uh, much. Uh, she has seven children, two adopted, uh, and is more of a traditional conservative Catholic in her personal views. Um, which again, they ask her about, uh, uh, which they ask her about in very inappropriate ways and, at, at some yeah. times. But she's been on the court now, on the Federal Court of Appeals for a few years. She's actually uh, got opinions on a number of these issues, religious freedom, she's been really good. Uh, sanctity of life, she's been good. Uh, you know, really uh, second amendment, very strong. So she's actually got a record on uh, a lot of the big issues and she's been an originalist and very, uh, a true to what conservatives are looking for in justices who are not trying to push politics into their opinions, but actually be a judge and uh, and to rule the way that, you know, and, and with the conservative philosophy that, that we expect. So that's why she's at the top of the list. She was also considered the second choice last time. It was between her and Kavanaugh. And um, uh, the president went with Kavanaugh. Many people thought because the Senate was 51-49 at the time, and they just didn't have many votes to lose. And because she's pro-life, because Amy Coney Barrett is pro-life and Catholic, uh, they thought they could uh, lose a couple of the women, uh, Collins and Murkowski, mm. because they're pro-choice. Wow. So that's why many people thought she wasn't picked last time. But now it's 40, 43, 40, uh, uh, 53, 47. So there's more room. Uh, and even without those two women votes, you'd still get her through. So many people think she's definitely at the top of the list. Nice. Okay. Who's this other woman? Uh, Barbara Lagoa. Is that right? Is that the other woman who's yes. I'm hearing she, about? She is, she is a Cuban, uh, uh, again, Catholic woman uh, out of the state of, of Florida. She is kind of new to the list uh, for, she's now in the 11th Circuit Federal Court of Appeals, which is uh, uh, there, it covers Florida and some other states in, in the Southeast. Uh, again, she's been really solid on across the board on, on the issues with her cases. The issue with her is she hasn't had as, as much time to really sort of prove herself. So if you were to like look at the issues that many people care about, whether it's religious freedom, Second Amendment, et cetera, you'd find that she's addressed a few of them and done very well, but she just hasn't had the numbers like an Amy Coney Barrett has to show where she would be. Uh, because here's the problem I, I think for many of us is in the past the sort of Republican approach has been let's find somebody who's an originalist on like administrative law and all this oh look at this wonderful originalist opinion and they say so we can assume that on all the hot button cultural issues they'll be an originalist too and I think with Gorsuch people just realized with his recent opinion this summer that that's not really the case and why these people kind of drift and so many people now are looking for, let's find somebody who's not only originalist on these business or, or regulation issue or whatever, but who's also an originalist when these big cultural issue cases come along. They, they, they don't push yeah. you know, the, the comments of the day or the politics of the day. Instead, they, they do things like say, Roe v. Wade's not in the Constitution. <laughs> it's, it's not in there. Um, and, uh, and so that's what we're looking for is more people who are true originalists and actually follow what the text says what the original meaning says. And uh, again, Lagoa has fewer record points than Barrett, which is why I think Barrett's uh, a little, yep. certainly a little bit in the lead okay. on her. I wanted to ask you about the three senators who are on the list, Ted Cruz and, and Cotton and uh, one other guy. But they're not going to be nominated. First of all, they're guys. Second of all, um, they would lose a vote. And they wouldn't be able to vote on themselves, I imagine. Um, so that's not going to happen. Is there another name here uh, out of the short list that you think has a chance uh, or at least that you would like to see nominated. Yeah, now look, I want to be honest. If we were going with the best record and the person we would never have to worry about on the court, it would be Jim Ho, uh, but it's not going to be a male. And so because it's going to be a female, the next two you would see on the list are Sarah Pitlick, 
Uh, Sarah Pitlick is uh, uh, a really strong conservative. We think probably maybe one of the strongest records. But she's on the district mm -hmm. court, and a lot of people, you know, don't know her yet. So uh, and it, there's such a short time frame for this that I, I think that's why she's not in the running right now is because people would have to get to know her. They have to do a lot of vetting and a lot of hearings, and, and I think there's just not as much time, whereas Lagoa and Barrett have been through hearings to be federal court of appeals judges, and so ah, there's been more – more, more sunlight. The other person is Rushing, uh, Judge Rushing. And again, she's really good too. Uh, uh, and, but again, her issues are, number one, she hasn't had that uh, enough time on the court uh, where people can see a lot. And I think the big issue for her is she's 38 years old. And so while that would wow. be a pretty brave move to put her, if you got a really strong conservative justice on the Supreme Court at 38, that would be awesome. I just think Many people look at that and think, oh, the Supreme Court, that's too young. And so she she's definitely one, I think, in the running in the future. But I have a feeling she she wouldn't be there now. Yeah, that would be a tougher sell right now. Yeah, 38. Geez, that's amazing. Good for her. Um, yep. Who's this James Ho? Why, why, what makes him so noteworthy? He's, you know, if you look at the Trump judges, the people who Trump has appointed to the courts and what they've done, uh, Ho just is in a league of his own. He's he's issued uh, opinions on sanctity of life, religious freedom, the Second Amendment, uh, campaign finance, uh, racial quotas, transgenderism. Uh, I mean, I could keep going. I mean, he's he's got a lot of these judges. What they do is kind of avoid letting people know where they stand if they don't have to because they don't want to sort of ruin their political future of being raised. <laughs> yeah. Jim Ho is not of that mindset. He's a Clarence Thomas type guy. He says, look, this is what the law is. He doesn't care about the politics. And so he's kind of left a big trail. Uh, you don't have to worry about what he is. He's not one of those guys you'd have to worry about. If he gets on the Supreme Court, will he drift? There's no way. He's yeah. already shown exactly what he would be. He'd be a lot like Clarence Thomas. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so out of what I'm hearing out of all that is Comey Barrett. Coney Barrett. Is that probably right? I think so. I think if people were putting odds on it, I bet it would be 90% Coney Barrett and 10% uh, and Barbara would, Lagoa at this and, point. And would she would would she do a good job uh, during the hearing process? Like when she was, when uh, Feinstein said your dogma lives loudly within you, did she stand up to that well? Um, would she do good during these crazy Kavanaugh-like hearings? I, you know, I have a hard time predicting that. Um, she's, uh, you know, she did well last time. She's not a, a strong in your face kind of person. Uh, so she wouldn't react that way if people wanted her to. She's a little more quirky. She was a law professor, uh, but uh, I think she'd come across well and, uh, and she obviously did well in her last hearing. And you know, God knows what they're gonna bring at uh, whoever this person is. I mean, people need to really be praying for this person and their family because uh, I think the other side has been so vicious that uh, obviously they can't use that she's the male predator approach like they tried with <laughs> yep. uh, Kavanaugh, but I'm sure they're going to try something uh, really horrible. Who knows? Yeah, who knows what's on the table? We just got about 30 seconds. Can you tell me about that poll we were talking about before we came on? Yeah, a uh, poll just came out. It was actually done before uh, the Ginsburg seat uh, opened up. Uh, she passed away about whether if a seat did open up, the American people thought it should be filled. Uh, you know, or to wait to the election. And 67% of the country said, yeah, they should fill the seat. Uh, we need the court at full capacity. And especially going into the elections, if we have a, a fight over the elections, we need a full, uh, you know, court to, to deal with that. Yeah, very good. Uh, Kelly Shackelford from the First Liberty Institute. Kelly, can we do it another day? Talk another day. Um, I really want someone who can break down Roe v. Wade. Um, I mean, we know the the big social aspects of it, but like legally, what was right. the Roe v. Wade decision and what was Casey and how could this change in the future? Could we do that another day? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that'd be great. A First Liberty Institute, what's the website, sir? Uh, for, you just spell it out, firstliberty.org. Okay, beautiful. Thanks, Kelly, appreciate you. Hey, happy to do it. Have a wonderful day. Uh, coming up next, we've got Professor Vincent Racaniello. We'll do our uh, COVID update of the day. True story, Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Senator Crusaders, that's enough Supreme Court talk for one day. I'm 
Pretty sure we'll do more tomorrow. Uh, let's talk COVID as we do every Monday with the professor of virology at Columbia University. And he is the host of uh, TWIV this week in virology. Go to microbe.tv. And uh, this is where you should get your uh, coronavirus news. Don't listen to anyone else. Don't pay attention to anyone else. Uh, I trust the professor. Uh, professor, this weekend more than most, I had a lot of people ask me about something. And my response is always, I don't know. I'll ask the professor on Monday. So this CDC report about airplanes. Mm -hmm. Last we talked, I believe, I don't want to mischaracterize you. Your thought on flying was you should be concerned if the person next to you is not wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. That's the, so it's not it's not like someone in the in first class like the air is going to like go to like the back of the plane and everyone gets it. Uh, but we have this new CDC report that got a lot of attention. Uh, have you seen it? And and what do you note from this? Haven't seen it, Mike. Got you. Got no, me. the first stump. Well, now I got to wait till next Monday. What do I, hey, tell what tell me what sing? it says, and I'll, I'll tell you what I think. Well, uh, let's see here. Do, do, do. I'll read the abstract. Um, it was a 10-hour flight. It was from, like, London to Vietnam, I think. Mm -hmm. We investigated a cluster of cases among passengers on a 10-hour flight. Uh, affected persons were passengers, crew, and their close contacts. We traced 217 passengers and crew to their final destination, interviewed, tested, quarantined them. Here it is. Among the 16 persons in whom SARS-CoV-2 was infected, so 217 passengers, 16 people, 12, 75%, were passengers seated in business class, mm -hmm. along with the only symptomatic person, attack rate 62%. I don't know what that term means. We'll get to that. Seating proximity was strongly associated with increased risk, increased infection risk. Risk ratio 7.3, 95%. C1, 1.2 to 46.2. We found no strong evidence supporting alternative transmission scenarios. Uh, one last line, in-flight transmission that probably originated from one symptomatic passenger caused a large cluster of cases during a long flight. Guidelines uh, to prevent SARS infection among air passengers should be considered, should consider individual passengers' risk for infection, the number of passengers traveling, and the flight duration. There's your abstract. What do you gather? Oh, so this fly? is... Uh... Very interesting because this week I've been thinking a lot about what we call super spreading events. In other words, an event where a lot of people get infected from one person. And it's clear that in socially close situations, restaurants, bars, you know, gyms, temples, weddings, that's when this happens. And I'm going to add to that airplanes because you got a lot of people put together close in a short in a, for a long period of time. And if one person's infected, that person can infect everybody else or many other people. So that's what happened here. It's interesting, they're all in business class. I'll bet a lot of them weren't wearing their masks, uh, even though the airlines require it to, they can't force now, you to look, wear it. Let me, let me throw this away, because I'm just, just thinking about that. I believe this flight was on March 2nd. Ah. So this would have been before there were even... Masking, Anyone yes. was even talking about masks. Oh, that, so that explains it then. If you're not wearing a mask on a plane, then all bets are off. If there's one infected person and you're sitting next to them for 10 hours, of course you're going to get infected. Yeah. So yeah, this. I'm, if, I'm, if I'm reading this right, um, it was a landing in Hanoi on March 2nd. Yeah, it's very early yeah. on. You're okay. right. There so probably nobody was wearing oh, so masks. That's, yeah, so that's a... Geez, I wonder if the headlines or if what people are reading of this mention that. Probably because that's not. a very yeah. you're saying that <laughs> so you're saying that's a very different case than my father-in-law visiting in a couple weeks, um, if people are wearing masks and properly spaced. Yeah, I think uh, if you wear a mask and you and the airline is spacing people out, but as I've said, you should sit up near the window because that way you avoid people walking up and down the aisle next to you, right? Mm -hmm. Going to the bathroom, so the window is the best seat for that. And you know, as I said before, the air goes down from the top; it doesn't circulate around the whole plane. <laughs> It's filtered. So those people in business, curiously, they didn't infect people in the back. And that's completely consistent with that. You know, in you business... Do not, uh, do not infect they, people. They did not. And the business yeah. people, they all cluster together and they chat and so yeah. forth. It's consistent with that kind of interaction. Yeah, for sure. But there have been okay. a number yeah, of studies that's... this week looking at clusters. And, you know, restaurants, gyms... Uh, and, and there was one report out of Japan, karaoke bars is a big one because yeah, people are yeah, yeah. singing. It's a big risk. Sure, Temples, yeah, yeah, weddings, all these group 
uh, interactions, those are where most of the infections are happening. And I have a number for you that I think is so important. This is yeah. 19, 20 percent of people who are infected do 80 percent of the transmission. Yeah. So 20 percent of the people do 80 percent of the transmission and 70 percent of people who are infected never infect anyone else. So it's really focused on a few people like in this airplane. One person up in business is infecting a lot of other people. So yeah, what's it? I know you're not an epidemiologist, although yeah, this is what you do. What's an attack rate? Attack rate, 62 percent. It's the fraction of people that that are infected, actually, in this particular outbreak that they're looking at. So they're saying 62 percent of the people on the plane. No, that's not right. Well, how many people um, were uh, on the among plane? The six Okay, among the 16, there are 217 people on the plane. 16 people were infected, or at the end. 12 yeah. were passengers seated in business class. Attack rate 62%. Yeah, so the attack rate is the number of cases divided by the, the total population. So they're they probably just limited to business class, I guess. Yeah, okay, okay, that makes sense. Okay. That. Um, okay, good to know. Masks. That's the that's the moral of that story right there. Yeah. Um, you know, I got one, I one more. Go, yeah, please. I just wanted to point out one other. There's a study to, this week also showing that uh, if you wear glasses, you are, are less likely to get <laughs> COVID-19 disease. The number is in this one study: six percent of the people got COVID-19 who are wearing glasses as opposed to 31% who got it without wearing, who weren't wearing glasses. So uh, you might want to go out and buy a pair of glass, even if you don't need glasses, just wear <laughs> glasses. No way. So that's literally just from from or particles getting in your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Because they can do that and you can't start there. So uh, and that's a Mike, statistical difference. That's a statistical difference there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, could, you don't even need to be a statistician to look at 31 versus yeah. 6%, right? Uh, this, yeah, is a, this is a study of 276 patients uh, in China. All right. So, um, you know, it could be that people who wear glasses do other things to reduce their risk, but I'm wearing glasses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I got one uh, antibody study here. AB5, COVID-19 breakthrough, um, about this, an antibody component known as AB5. Uh, do you know anything about this? So, yeah, a number of new antibodies have been published. These are different groups making antibodies against the virus, right? You can do that pretty easily. You can take a patient who's been infected. You could take their B cells. Remember, my B cells? Yeah, all about the B cells. cells. They make the antibodies. You could take them from a patient and, and make antibodies from those. And, you know, a lot of labs are doing this to try and treat people. And one study last week showed if you treat people with antibodies really early, like just after they're PCR positive, you can actually make a difference. Uh, but you, if you treat them in hospital, that's too late. The problem with these antibodies uh, is they all have to be given intravenously. So you're going to have to go to a healthcare provider to get them. And they only last a few weeks, right? So Yeah. Why, so why are we spending... I, I don't want to be rude to the people dedicating their life to this, but it seems like that, that's a, those are huge hurdles. you got to get it, as you said, intravenously. It's got to be before you're yeah. even in the hospital. I reckon it's hard to even get in the first place, like hard to make this. Yes, um, I agree. So like, I why, agree. Like, why, why then, right? So, so I agree. I mean, there have been some outbreaks in Africa of Ebola where, you know, you can give it to a few thousand people. But here we're talking about millions of people, unless you just want to give it to healthcare workers, right? Maybe you say people right. in hospitals, we give them antibodies every few weeks. That that kind of makes sense, but not the whole population. Okay. I agree with that, yeah. Okay, fair. Uh, we got about a minute. Just leave it up to you, Professor. What else is on your mind? What else do we need to know? So I, I really think it's important for people to realize that we're now seeing in multiple studies that most of the transmission is happening in social situations, not so much at home, but social situations, restaurants, bars, uh, weddings, temples, karaoke <laughs> bars. Yeah. And these are studies from all over the world. And that's where most of the infection is happening. So it's really important to either stay away from them or if you're going to go, make sure they space people apart, make sure they uh, require you to wear face masks. And that way you're going to be protected. Is there transmission in touching things still? Uh, I remember that was very early on. That was the big thing, right? The hand sanitizer and everything. Yes, and of course. Have we been able to track that? Or is it mostly well, air? I think the, the vast majority is through the air. 
right? There certainly is a component, but we haven't been able to nail that down. But I think it's easy enough to to wash your hands and, and don't touch your face. I would keep doing that because yeah. it's generally yeah, good anyway. That's interesting. How in the beginning, that was definitely like the most the most prevalent way. It seemed like it was spread, um, but now it's now it's mostly focused on the ear. Professor, one last thing. My whole life, I've pronounced it karaoke. Am I wrong? Is it karaoke? I think you're karaoke. probably right. What do I Kara know? <laughs> you're not a big karaoke? I thought maybe you were like the king of karaoke in New York City, and like you know. knew that it was karaoke. No, you're probably right, karaoke. Yeah, I say a lot of things wrong, but I, I don't do well, karaoke, listen, it's, karaoke, no. It's the first time I've, uh, I've known something <laughs> the professor didn't. So I get one. <laughs> one point for Slater. I'll be the first to admit thousand for the professor. <laughs> Mike, Mike, I'll be the first to admit that once you take me outside of viruses, I was just uh, going to say that's a little outside your your yeah, uh, your field of study. I'm pretty narrow. I'm pretty but I, narrow. But I, but I, but I, I, I went with it. I was like, I think, I like, who knows? The professor might be right on this. Yeah, uh, professor, I, I, always I, good I, to talk to you, sir. Microbe.tv, everyone, go listen to the podcasts, um, and that's where I, I and hopefully you get your information. Thanks, professor. Uh, my pleasure. See you next time. Have a great day. We'll see you on Monday. True story. Mike Slater. We'll do it tomorrow. Spread the word.